thank you. If everyone could sit, we could uh, sit down, get started. This is our panel on CBDC. Uh, it wouldn't be a financial conference in the early 2020s if we didn't have a panel on CBDC. So we're, we have to fulfill that obligation. Now, for those of you who are just resurfacing after two years in your COVID bunker, a central bank, uh, CBDC is a central bank digital currency. It's a central bank liability that is a digital means of uh, retail payments. CBDC can be designed roughly in, in two ways. Uh, you can have an account-based CBDC, which is effectively like Fedwire. Everyone who's going to use it has an account one way or the other, and the payments uh, that take place take place by debiting an account and crediting another account. Now, no central bank wants to have millions of account holders, so these, this, pro this way is almost always envisioned as being intermediate, so there would be commercial banks and other financial institutions that would stand between the central bank and the, and the, and the users of the CBDC, handle the wallets, handle the know your customer. The other way is a token-based uh, CBDC. Uh, for those of you who were listening to Vice Chair Brainerd, uh, she was definitely saying that the Fed was more interested in the intermediated uh, method, but there is this other method that gets discussed. Token-based is a lot more like paper currency. The CBDC uh, in and of itself is, uh, demonstrates its validity, the use of it. It's destroyed when I give it to you, and then you have something new, and it's it's just a different approach. Uh, now, 11 countries have already launched CBDC. The largest of those is Nigeria. Uh, 14 countries are running pilot programs. 26 are in development stage, and 47 are studying the idea. Now, I can, I can actually recall discussing the prospect of a CBDC more than a decade ago, uh, around the time that Scandinavian countries, in particular Sweden, experienced a very steady and significant decline in the use of currency. And the question then was, you know, do individuals need to have a means to settle transactions in a central bank liability? The idea got uh, renewed traction starting, I'd say, about seven or eight years ago. Uh, as a means to comprehensively uh, enforce negative interest rates on the economy. The idea being you know, quantitative easing, forward guidance were somewhat uh, not ideal ways to uh, simulate the economy when interest rates were at zero. So if you could get below zero, you wouldn't have to do those things. Uh, but more recently, uh, the, the particular interest more recently seems to have been, is, has been associated with uh, Facebook, uh, Libra, DM uh, project in which uh, the, the Facebook plan to have a, uh, a stable coin, a, a coin with a fixed value, in this case relative to a bundle of currencies. And there was a lot of concern about the potential for that to take off internationally with a lot of uh, disruption. And CBC was seen as potentially an answer to that. And then more recently, it's been, it's received a fair amount of attention as a means to address the financial stability risks associated with uh, cryptocurrencies uh, more broadly. Uh, so, um, but suddenly, you know, it's become broader. It's like CDCs are the solution to the world's ills. They, uh, they will replace stable coins. They will facilitate government payments. Uh, they will uh, reduce financial in, uh, inclusion problems. Uh, and uh, perhaps just as importantly, all the cool central banks are introducing a CBDC, so you don't <laughs> you don't want to be behind you, you know the, the, you don't want a CBDC gap to open up. Uh, but CBDCs also run the risk of being extraordinarily disruptive to the financial system, in large part because they look and feel like a bank deposit, but they are a funding source for the central bank. They're a liability of the central bank. They they can fund, in the U.S. case, the Fed's purchases of Treasuries and Agency MBS. Uh, they're not a funding source for banks, even in a disintermediated model. So that means that those funds, if there was a movement from uh, deposits to CBDC, that would be funds that were not available to finance loans to businesses and, and households. Uh, and that's particularly worrisome during periods of stress when there's a good reason to think that there could be flights to quality into CBDC, and that undermines one of great qualities of deposits as a funding source for banks, which is that they tend to experience inflows when banks have significant draws in their lines of credit. Uh, and so if that feature was taken away,
So we are very fortunate to have an extraordinary group of panelists uh, here today to discuss prospects for a CBDC in the United States. So going, going alphabetically, uh, so Jordan Bleeker uh, from the Treasury Department is here. He advises the Undersecretary for Domestic Finance on issues related to digital assets, including the forthcoming, still forthcoming, didn't come out in the last few hours, executive order on the future of money and payments. Uh, Duncan Douglas uh, is a partner uh, at Alston Bird LLP. Duncan heads Alston and Bird's payment systems practice and focuses on transactions, product development, and regulatory issues related to retail and wholesale payments and products. Now, that's weird, we're actually going, maybe they must have set it up alphabetically. Yeah. Uh, it wasn't just a coincidence. Uh, so Daryl Duffy is the Adams Distinguished Professor of Management and Professor of Finance at the Stanford Business School. Uh, Daryl is a globally recognized expert on CBDC, uh, most having testified uh, before the House of Lords in the UK and the Senate Banking Committee here in the United States. Uh, Jim Reuter is the Chief Executive Officer uh, uh, and CEO of First Bank. Uh, Jim is the chair of ABA's uh, Payment System uh, Advisory Committee and a member of the Federal Reserve Faster Payments Task Force Steering Committee. And then I guess I must have gone out of order. Randy Quarles uh, needs no introduction, but I will introduce him anyway. He's the chairman and co-founder of the Sinisher Group and was previously the Federal Reserve Board's Vice Chair for Supervision. So uh, I was been curious, so I finally looked up Sinisher, and it means an object that serves as a focal point of attention and admiration. And that's certainly uh, how I feel about it. <laughs> so, um, so um, we, we all got together and discussed uh, the sort of the questions that one could, could ask, the, the important questions regarding CBDC. Settled on a fairly long list of questions, and uh, we're gonna now walk our way through them, and then at the end we'll We'll have time to take uh, questions from the audience. So, so to start, uh, actually for uh, our signature, uh, so Randy. So, um, so should so as as I might have mentioned when when CBDCs first came up, the the, the existential question was, well, if paper currency goes away, you know, don't individuals need to have the right? Don't they have the right? Don't they need the ability to settle transactions in a central bank liability? Uh, and so, therefore, shouldn't there be a CBDC, shouldn't there be a digital central bank liability that can be used to settle retail payments? So should the public have the ability to settle transactions digitally in a central bank liability? Well, um, uh, so I guess I'd, uh, so I guess I'd say, you know, when the, when you phrase the issue that way, you know, the, the immediate reaction is why? Uh, but then, you know, when you think about it a little more deeply and reflect on it for a bit, uh, the question comes up, why on earth? <laughs> uh, because, uh, I mean, the, the question itself is sort of an indication of how the, the CBDC discussion has evolved over the course of the last three years. So you had this, you know, 2019, the summer of Facebook and DM and, uh, uh, and the governments of the world lost their minds, and with my chairman of the FSB hat on, I would sit in these meetings of the finance ministers of the G7, and, you know, and they would fulminate that private companies issuing money was a threat to the sovereignty of nations. The, the French finance minister in particular was particularly magnificent. Uh, <laughs> and, you know, and, and then there would be aides who would be kind of tugging on their sleeves and say, Minister, is issued by private companies. <laughs> it's issued by banks, uh, except for the tiny little pieces of paper in our pocket. So you know that that argument began to go to the wayside. And then it was, well, we have to compete with the Chinese. The Chinese have a central bank digital currency. We've got to do the same. Why we think that we have to uh, mimic a device that has been devised by the Chinese to increase the oppressiveness with which they control their populace is uh, is beyond me. Uh, so. And then be, we, we talked about financial inclusion. You know, so the argument's okay, that's not gonna work, that's gonna work. Financial inclusion must be the argument for CBDCs. So the notion that in order to buy a cup of coffee in the morning, 
you now need not a little piece of paper in your pocket, but an iPhone and a 5G digital service and a coffee seller who's going to have the mechanics in order to interact with your iPhone. That is the opposite of financial inclusion. So the argument has seems to have evolved, the current one, is, well, people need to feel that when they spend their money, they are interacting with their central bank. They, they need to have that connection, that deep, personal connection. Um, well, you know, I, as fond as the next person of the Federal Reserve, uh, when I said, gave my farewell remarks to the FOMC, I even kind of choked up a little bit. And, uh, but even I don't feel the need for some mystical union with my country's central bank. It's just when I go to, uh, with a credit card and I spend some money, that is not interacting with the Federal Reserve at all. That is transferring a claim on a private company to another private company. Uh, I don't feel in any way impaired in my confidence in my country or world by the fact that my doing that does not connect me in some deep emotional way to the central bank. And I don't think that if we had a world in which digital currencies were entirely provided by the private sector in the way that electronic money currently is entirely provided by the private sector, that the populace would suffer in any way. So that's a no. <laughs> <laughs> would anyone else like to, uh, to, uh, to take a stab at this one? I would just comment that the Federal Reserve is my primary regulator, mm -hmm. so I'm going to say it's, it's good they study it. <laughs> <laughs> but I, do th I do think the Federal Reserve has a responsibility to go out and, and study it, but I, I'll get to it in a minute. I don't agree that we need a central bank to do it. But I think getting smart about it, why other countries are doing it, I think it's a responsible thing for us to do. Okay. Okay. So, Jordan? I know it's tough being the representative of the, of the government in, in, under these circumstances, um, but um, we're really glad you're here. We recognize that these are your views and your views alone. Um, so uh, if a CBDC were created in the United States, uh, what form would it be likely to take? Uh, so I discussed the two main contenders, and but also there's an, there's an, an additional important issue, which is would it be likely to pay interest? Um, so first of all, what you said. Don't, you have to say oh. To you and, and to BPI for hosting this panel, and thanks for uh, inviting me to, to participate in it. It's, it's an honor and a privilege to, to be here today. Thank you. Um, so uh, the question of the form of a CPDC, as you know, Bill, is an enormously complicated one. Um, so let me just offer a, a few thoughts about it. Uh, the first is that in our thinking, not just about CBDC, but the future of money and payments more broadly, um, there's really a pretty broad set of policy objectives that inform that thinking. Sort of goals include, uh, one, supporting a more efficient, innovative, and inclusive payment system, um, helping to preserve U.S. global financial leadership, uh, also helping to, to uh, maintain the singleness of the currency in the United States, whether that's uh, under threat because of the rise of digital assets or, or for other reasons. Um, in terms of uh, the design choices, the form that a C CBDC would take, uh, you frankly outlined many of the key uh, issues in, in your introductory remarks. But I mean, the striking thing is um, there's really many, many different forms that the CBDC could take. And in our thinking uh, about this, we've kind of bracketed those decisions into three main areas. Um, so you have the characteristics of the CBDC as a monetary instrument. Uh, who can hold the CBDC? Would it be a retail or wholesale CBDC? Would it be holding limits? Would it pay interest? Um, second are uh, payment system characteristics. So um, how would the CBDC be, be supported? Would it be supported by either a centralized or distributed ledger? Uh, what, what's the range of use cases for which it could be, could be used? Um, and the third uh, set of choices relates to the intermediation model. Um, and I, I think this was a focus of, of your introductory remarks. And there, uh, the question really is, would individuals hold the CBDC directly or would it be intermediated in some fashion? Um, if, it's if it's intermediated, uh, are those intermediaries banks or non-banks? So 
many different policy objectives, many different design choices, lot, lots to figure out. Um, the third question you asked, or the third aspect is, would the CBDC bear interest? Um, as you know, that's uh, another multifaceted issue. Uh, lots of considerations on, on both sides, to, to name a few. Uh, I think you'd want to think about effects on both deposit rates and lending rates. Um, and that's probably something that we'll return to uh, later, later in the panel. Um, you'd want to think about the financial stability implications of, this, of an interest-bearing CBDC. So um, ex ante, you might think that if it's interest-bearing, it would be more likely to crowd out risky forms of money, and that would be a financial stability benefit. Uh, on the other hand, in stress, you might worry about destabilizing um, inflows into the CBDC, so you'd have to sort of be prepared to adjust the interest rate to mitigate that risk. Um, and then uh, third and finally, you, you'd want to think about the relationship between an interest-bearing CBDC and other liabilities of the central bank. So notably cash doesn't pay interest, um, the wholesale liabilities including reserve balances um, do, and so depending on whether uh, the CBDC paid interest, um, you'd want to think about incentives to hold some forms of, of central bank liability or Fed liability over others. So, uh, lots of complicated issues, and those are some of the things we're, we're thinking. Great, thank you. Uh, I'll, I'll look forward to the report. <laughs> uh, so, um, Jim, uh, so uh, if there were an account-based, intermediated CBDC in the United States, how would banks adjust? What um, would be the incentive for banks to participate, to be intermediaries, and what entities broadly should be permitted to be yeah, that, that's a good question. You know, I want to put a little bit of a point on something you touched on in the introduction, and that's loss of deposits, just to give you an example. So we're a $29 billion bank. Uh, we're largely retail. And so we ran queries. Let's say you put a de minimis cap of $1,000 or even $2,500. I'll go up to that amount on the wallet. It's over 60% of our consumer accounts, we think, <laughs> would be eligible to keep their money in a CBDC wallet at the Fed. So that's a significant impact to a bank that uh, I think uh, does amazing things in the community. I mean, we raised over $50 million for 2,000 nonprofits in 24 hours. Um, that's banking for good, as we call it. So, so when we talk about the potential impact to banks and the loss of deposits, it's a real impact to the community in which we're, we're residing in and making loans. To your point, would we be interested in being an intermediary? Of course we would. Um, we're probably the most trusted entities to do it. We've seen that example with stable coins here most, most recently. You know, they didn't need to be in the banking system. Now, could we be part of it? Um, we know how to do AML BSA, which I didn't see in the paper was a voluntary activity at the Federal Reserve. So I'm assuming that would be ours. Um, we're good at customer service. Um, you know, we, uh, I know uh, Acting Comptroller Sue talked about, you know, putting out, um, customer confidence surveys. I'm in the business of customer confidence, so I don't need a survey to help me determine whether we're doing a good job or not. Are we winning or are we not? Um, as far as other intermediaries go, it worries me um, because I know some of the folks that would line up to be really excited about getting in this spot would be Meta, Google, Amazon, and they're in the data business. They're not in the safeguarding uh, individuals' money and assets business. and so. Uh, they'll probably do other things with that information than we would do as a bank. They're not subject to Graham Leach Bliley. So uh, I think the banks would step in, play the role. Um, we'd see other opportunities to try to expand relationships. I don't want to downplay what would be some benefits, but there's more loss than there would be benefit by us playing that role. And we shouldn't be fooled about non-banks coming in and saying they're going to be good intermediaries. Thanks. Duncan. So, uh, would, so there's currently about 5% of the population has no banking account, 15% is un underbanked, meaning they often use expensive non-banks for important financial services. Uh, would CBDC help solve that? Yeah, I, I don't see the use case um, uh, there in the United States. And I know we're largely focused on the United States and, and you mentioned in your introductory remarks that there are a number of countries that either have you know, launched or piloting or, or exploring 
CBDC, and one of the, the leading justifications for doing it is financial inclusion. And when you look at you know, Nigeria, or you think about the M-Pesa product that started in Kenya, where there was, you know, there's very difficult access to financial services. The financial services infrastructure is fairly poor, um, and they're, the folks are geographically dispersed. Um, financial inclusion opportunities of a CBDC are, are much more prevalent uh, than, than they would be in the United States, I think. In, in the US, um, there have been a number of studies, the FDIC has conducted some that, that reflect why we have 5% consumers in the U.S. unbanked and 15 plus or minus percent underbanked. And there are things like lack of trust in banks and the government. I'm not sure a CBDC uh, solves that. Um, lack of access to, uh, to instrumentalities they need to access banking, including digital, meaning they don't have internet access or they don't have the types of mobile devices that they need to access banking services in the way they want to. Um, the lack of a need for a bank. Say I've got cash in my pocket and I have immediate access to cash. I can protect my cash, you know, sticking it under the mattress or whatever. Um, I'm less confident in, in digital forms of currency because I can't touch it, I can't feel it, I can't hold it. What happens if it, uh, if it goes away? These are just some of the reasons that respondents have said um, you know, why, they don't, um, you know, why they don't use traditional banking services. And, and I don't see a central bank digital currency solving any of those issues Unless, I guess another is uh, inability to, to satisfy account opening requirements, KYC and LCIP. Um, and and to, to Jordan's point, there are a number of design choices uh, that, that the Fed would have with respect to a CBDC. Some of those could marginally impact financial inclusion, but they would all come at a cost. For example, we could say we'll allow non-banks um, to host wallets that would hold CBDC as intermediaries. Uh, but will establish lower prudential requirements for them. So, you know, perhaps the safekeeping function for the uh, for the CBDC would be compromised. Um, we'll establish a lower threshold of requirements for uh, establishing that wallet. You know, lower KYC CIP requirements. But then that undermines, you know, the purpose of um, anti-money laundering, anti-terrorist financing regimes that apply to the existing banking system. So. Again, those design choices could, at the margin, maybe encourage some folks who uh, are held out of the banking system kind of involuntarily right now and would love to have ac you know, access to that. Again, those seem to be uh, more marginal slivers of the folks who are unbanked and underbanked. And those design, design choices come at a, a cost that, so far at least, we've not been willing to make um, uh, with respect to the traditional banking system, so. Jordan? I, um, I, agree with a lot of what was said. I, I make a few points, though, in, in response. Um, one is, I, I do think that there's an issue in account inclusion that we need to address in the United States. If you compare uh, the percentage of unbanked that we have in the United States to other G7 countries, um, I, I think we're in last place, or, or at least close to last place. So, so there is an issue of inclusion. Um, second, I, I would not claim that CBDC is the silver bullet or the unique solution to the inclusion problem. Um, there are lots of things we should be thinking about, private sector initiatives, uh, public sector initiatives, including things uh, related to the deployment of instant payment systems. Um, so I won't say that. Uh, and then the third point is, um, I think what you said about uh, CBDC and the importance of intermediaries is a key variable. I, I agree with that. Um, I think that to the extent that uh, a CBDC does promote inclusion, um, the question of intermediation will be really central to how it does it. Um, and if non-banks are to play a role, then they need to be subject to appropriate oversight. So I'm going to push ahead, Daryl. So, uh, so you're up. So uh, what does CBDC uh, <laughs> increase competition for bank deposits? And what would be the consequence for the availability of bank credit? Good, good. Thanks, Bill. I think this is, might be one of the topics on which we might differ at least somewhat. Uh, so would it increase competition for bank deposits? Well, that depends whether anybody wants to use the CBDC. And uh, I don't think just providing it, I mean, consistent with what a lot of people have been saying here, just providing it uh, through banks is necessarily going to work to get people to want to use it. Uh, 
uh, Randy would not necessarily take it up, for example. But you know, if, if Alice goes to the CVS store or Bob wants to buy his United Airline ticket, they want to get those cash reward back, so those free United miles. They don't want to use the CBDC. That's not giving them anything back. Uh, if uh, uh, let's take if the CBDC doesn't pay interest, and by the way, I don't think the Federal Reserve wants to compete with banks. I don't think it's going to pay interest. I think it would be unlikely, given what the Fed has said, in not a, about CBDC specifically, but in other forums, about its concern about competing with banks on an interest margin. I don't think it will offer interest, at least for some time, uh, if and when it's introduced, which will be a long time. Uh, and then, you know, the in the intermediated model, you know, if I was one of the bankers in this room responsible to my shareholders, I don't think I would advance the CBDC on my payment apps above the credit card apps that are much more profitable. That would not be a good thing for my bank. Uh, so all of these things could only be addressed if not only do you have a CBDC, but you also have regulation, perhaps maybe heavy-handed regulation uh, to get it into use. That's an issue. Could it, could it happen? In China, uh, the central bank uh, PBOC has introduced in pilots, but a pretty big pilot, 30 major cities, uh, a CBDC. It doesn't pay interest consistent with what I said, uh, but it is being kind of pushed. It's being given away. It's being required to use for certain purposes. The total take up at this point is $85 billion, which might seem like, well, that's a lot of money. I'd love to have $85 billion, but if you look at Alipay, they're doing $17 trillion of payments a year, more than Visa uh, globally. So would, would, it, would a US digital dollar actually get taken up? Depends entirely on the design. If you go to Brazil, for example, they introduced a fast payment system, which in my view is an extremely good substitute for a CBDC, maybe superior to a CBDC. And they required uh, low fees, they required that all the banks provided on an interoperable app, accessible to everyone. Every bank over 200,000 must provide it on an, uh, a common uh, app to all of their customers. Within two years, the, essentially the entire adult population in Brazil is using PIX, and it has increased financial inclusion enormously uh, in Brazil. Many people that were not bank now have bank accounts so they can get it. Many people that were using banks but going to ATM machines to get paper money out, they're using PIX. They're, and their, their life's improved because of it. So a lot in terms of uh, the outcomes that you're asking about depends on the design. Now, would it actually, if it were taken up, would it create higher interest rates on bank deposits? Mm, maybe, maybe not. There's a Bank of Canada study, which is the best calibrated model that I've seen that suggests that it would create higher interest rates for bank deposits that the quantity of bank deposits would rise, not fall, in response to the higher offered interest rate. People would use the CBDC to make their payments, but they would store their money in the bank. And to your last question, credit provision in that study goes up when calibrated. Now, there are other studies that say credit provision could go down, especially at small banks. And Jim's case is a particularly good one. If you're getting all of your funding from deposits, and you're putting essentially all of it into loans, then the marginal cost of funding goes up, you're gonna make fewer loans, and if you have overhead that you have to, uh, uh, you know, feed, you have to pay for buildings and, and so on, then you might not even make it uh, with a CBDC. For a large bank, uh, no. I'm, uh, actually, the best available studies show that it doesn't have a big impact for large banks. When they're making a loan, they're not saying, oh, I need to, Make, I'm, I'm gonna make this loan even though it loses money when I market to market value because I'm gonna offset the loss with my below market funding on deposits. They are, the large banks that are active in wholesale markets on the assets and liability side are comparing making a loan to investing in a marketable security. They're not gonna make a loser loan. If they're comparing it to a marketable security, then it's break even at market funding rates, not at deposit rates, which are much lower. So what would happen to large banks? They, unfortunately would get less profitable, but the loans that they would be making would not be significantly affected. And that seems to be true based on both the concept and the empirical evidence. So there you have it. Thank you. So uh, 
Brandon, um, so if there were a CBDC uh, in periods of severe stress, uh, think March 2020, uh, would there be, I mean, would the dash to cash have been into the CBDC rather than into bank deposits? And uh, if, if so, what would have the consequences been for banks? What would have the consequences been for monetary policy if you had another, if, you know, in, when you were back, when you were in that seat, if there had been another liability growing by uh, a trillion dollars? Yeah, I, I mean, I think it's, you know, I, I think it's inevitable that if you have a, uh, uh, you know, that if you have a relatively frictionless way in times of stress, to move directly to exposure to the central bank, that you will choose that option, uh, and certainly that you know that uh, at the margin enough people would choose that option uh, that it's going to materially increase the fragility of the traditional uh, financial system to have the option to move into the CBDC. Now, you know, Jordan described you know some ways that you would try you know you might try to address that. Uh, but, but all of them are sort of jury rigging and backfitting uh, a way to try to stop what's going to be a, you know, a very strong herd behavior instinct to say this is out there that we, you know, that you can't lose money on, uh, and to move into that to the extent that it's available. So I do think that that is that is uh, that a CBDC is. Is destabilizing to the traditional financial system in times of stress, uh, and, you know that the, the you know Fed is not really prepared to respond uh, to the uh, sort of different moves that would be made in those sorts of circumstances. You know, to support what Randy's saying, we saw this at Y two K. We just saw it here recently too, where people go withdraw more money mm -hmm. from the ATM in periods of stress. And so even though um, you know, Randy may have more than the 2,500, I mean, you're not being paid by the Board of Governors, so I don't know what it's looking like <laughs> these days, but you may have more than the cap on the wallet, there's still just some safety people feel in having cash. I think this wallet could uh, be a similar outcome in periods of stress. So just to follow up on that, uh, specifically, if, if there had been a CBDC and if there was an inflow and it went up a trillion dollars in March 2020, then reserve balances would have gone down by a trillion dollars in, in uh, March 2020 relative to what they were otherwise doing. Uh, would that have been problematic, or would that have actually been welcome given the, given the extraordinary growth in reserve balances that was happening at the time? Well, I, I think that it would have been uh, it would have been problematic if the so if the world had evolved somewhat differently, so that instead of the because of this significant amount of fiscal support, the banks didn't, uh, you know, didn't incur the losses that they would otherwise have, uh, that they might otherwise have. If you had a lot of, uh, you know, so if you had a lot of liquidity that was coming out of the banking system at a time when it was under severe uh, loss stress, that's, you know, that's not going to be a good thing. The, the problem, it would have helped with the problem that we actually faced in 2020, which is that, you know, because of the rise in reserves, we had to start throwing in the leverage ratios out the window right. in order to allow the banks to, uh, to accept them. So we wouldn't have had to do that, but we would have had, I think, a more significant problem. Uh, you know, that, that was a, a first world problem compared to the issues we would have had if we were sucking a bunch of money out of the banking system. Right. Thank you. So Jordan. Um, if the United States uh, does not introduce a CBDC, would the probability go up that the dollar would lose its status as the international currency for international transactions, the reserve currency? Uh, would the United States lose its ability to influence global CBDC outcomes? Uh, so let me make two points in response. Um, global role of the dollar. Uh, I think there the, the key point is that the factors that un underwrite the global role of the dollar fundamentally are structural things like respect for the rule of law, the strength of our economy, the depth and the breadth of our financial markets. Um, and these are things that are largely independent of, of whether the United States has a CBDC. 
Um, on the other hand, I do think we have a strong national interest uh, in seeing global adoption of payment systems that are consistent with privacy and other democratic values. And uh, you, you gave the statistics um, during your introduction. All told, there are about 100 countries that are experimenting with CBDC in one form or another. Um, some of those countries might move forward with, the, with those CBDCs. Uh, and we have an interest in having an influence, um, whether that means uh, in standard setting activities or um, engaging in cross-border pilots or through the provision of technical assistance. Um, and you might imagine that it would be easier for us to have an influence in those settings if we're seriously working on CBDC at home. It, so I, I couldn't agree more with uh, Jordan's point about the, you know, the, the roots of the dominance of the dollar, uh, and that you know, saying that in order to protect the dollar, we need to digitize it the way the Chinese are it would be like saying the Chinese are printing the renminbi on purple paper and we're still using green, and you know, so we've got to keep up. Um, but but I do think that the way for us the best way for the United States to prosecute its interests in the second set of issues that Jordan raised is for us to empower the private sector to proceed with offering uh, private digitized uh, assets uh, and digital currency. That that will, you know, if you allow the, the Facebooks and Amazons and, and American tech companies of the world to move into, or the, you know, or the banks of the world, to uh, move into providing these digital uh, assets, that will set the standards. I mean, that, that's how we'll have the most influence on setting the standards. That's how we'll have the most influence on uh, affecting the system as it evolves. And that's how we'll have the most influence in preserving the role of the dollar in a future digitized, you know, a, a, uh, a, a world in which currencies have been digitized. We just digitize them privately. So, Daryl, you're up for the next question, which is also on international issues, so I'll let you fold your uh, answer to that into a okay, good you. comment on that. Yes, so, uh, so, if the United States were to create a CBDC, uh, would non-U.S. citizens or non-U.S. banks be allowed to use the CBDC? Yeah, if good. not, how could you affect that? And if so, what would the consequences of that be? Good. Uh, as you noted, I, I wanted to interject on the last point as yeah, well. Please. Uh, I agree with Jim uh, that investigating uh, CBDC technology in answer to, to Randy's point would be a good idea because in the scenario that you painted, Randy, we, don't, we can't be 100% confident about how this is all going to work out with private digital currencies or with other innovations in the payment system. And as Jim said, investigating, having the option to use the technology later, having mastered it, I think would be a, a smart move. Uh, but coming back to the point you raised, uh, uh, again, it's partly a, uh, an issue of take up. But this case, uh, if the CBDC were provided internationally, I think take up would be quite strong, maybe uh, 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 unfavorably strong from the interest, from the viewpoint of the interests of the world as a whole, and maybe the U.S. It would support the dominance of the dollar if a U.S. CBDC were taken up internationally. It would harm the interests of some small open economies who might lose control of their own monetary systems. And if it were provided liberally and used within the financial systems or uh, economies of many countries, it could be a huge headache for the United States uh, or the Fed to track all of those, uh, the uses of those CBDCs. Banks would be charged with doing all the AML and KYC, but the footprint of the Fed uh, would, would be difficult, uh, a difficult thing to manage. More, the more likely model is one by which uh, the CBDC would be used internationally for cross-border payments, and then uh, other currencies would be used in other economies domestically. And the cross-border payments could be done not only by CBDCs, but I heard an interesting panel discussion this morning on IXB, which is interne interconnecting two different instant payment systems. That also seems very promising. Right. But cross-border payment of CBDCs seems like the first use case that might that might be beneficial if a CBDC is used at all. If there's no tick up domestically of the CBDC, uh, then a general purpose CBDC is not going to make it cross border anyway. That's actually a great segue to Jim's question, which is how, uh, how if at all, would a CBDC facilitate um, faster or less expensive international payments or remittances 
you know, this is one that I think gets oversimplified. And, and the reason is, is when we think about digital currencies, everybody jumps to Bitcoin or something that's been out there. And the reason that works so well across borders is it stays one currency all the time. Mm -hmm. It is a single currency. Um, a central bank digital currency, you know, I think Daryl said it well, if some other countries adopt or use the dollar, um, that would be a different outcome, but my guess is that won't be the case in the EU or China and other places. So even though the central bank has a, its own currency, it still has to get converted. And all the interoperability issues come into play, all the law of the land, and so it's oversimplified. So the, the short answer to your question is the devil is in the details. It's not as simple as everybody tries to make it sound. So I've been... Uh targeting the conversation exclusively on retail CBDC. Um, so, but there's also talk about wholesale CBDC. So, uh, Duncan, um, what would, you know, what benefits would a wholesale CBDC provide and how, how would it be designed? So I think, you know, to your point, Bill, we, we've talked pretty much exclusively thus far on the panel about uh, retail CBDC, one that would be available to, uh, you know, to, to the public. I think a, a wholesale CBDC would, would largely be a, there are lots of opportunities for structuring, but I think the, the, the structure that I see most often discussed is basically a tokenized, um, a, a tokenization of reserve bank liabilities such that in, when there's an interbank transfer of value rather than a Federal Reserve Bank or Federal Reserve Banks crediting and debiting um, financial institutions, depository institutions accounts with the Reserve Bank, there would be a direct exchange of tokens between those banks to reflect um, the liability, the transfer from you know from from one institution to the other to reflect the the, the, the assignment of, of of the transferred value. Um, you know, they, and folks say, well, there's a there's a efficiency in not having to involve those uh, you know those notional uh, adjustments to reserve bank uh, entries, reserve account entries, and perhaps a speed. Of uh, associated with uh, associated with those transactions, and, to, and with rec record keeping is on a uh, on a central ledger or distributed ledger. There would also be a record keeping uh, benefit. And I think those all uh, potentially would would offer promises. Uh, I think the question is whether the you know that type of solution, a wholesale um, you know a wholesale digital currency used by banks for interbank transfers, is is best accomplished by. Uh, a central bank digital currency on a wholesale basis, or whether there uh, are better opportunities for the private sector to develop um, a, a wholesale uh, digital currency that could be used for these types of transactions. And I think some of the points that Jim raised, for example, about cross-border transfers and the complexities associated with uh, with converting a central bank-backed uh, digital currency, because that would be necessary when there were cross-border large value transfers between banks, I think would blunt some of the benefits of a wholesale digital currency that, uh, that may not exist if a different type of token, perhaps not backed by a single central bank, um, were, were deployed. And there are some pilots being, you know, being done right now uh, by a number of large, uh, you know, large banks with, with wholesale operations, both in the U.S. and outside the U.S., to develop exactly this type of technology, or at least to explore whether or not it makes sense to use um, a token-based and ledger-based method of reflecting value transfers to reduce the reliance on intermediaries, uh, reduce the need for a currency conversion associated with those value transfers, at least at the, you know in the in the transaction flow itself. Um, so I would, you know, to, to me, that's um, it's it's worth exploring, worth investigating. I see you know some opportunity there, uh, but I would question whether the private sector isn't better, particularly on these large value transfers uh, between sophisticated institutions that developing their solution that, that wouldn't suffer from some of the limitations that would that would invariably apply to a central bank wholesale digital currency. So in the case of a central bank wholesale digital currency, would the participants only be the same participants who have master accounts now? That's I think that's an assumption in in, in most of the designs that I have seen of how wholesale uh, central bank digital currency would function. So I'm going to break the third wall here for a minute and, and observe that I only have a couple more questions left and this uh, tablet is not showing me any questions from the audience so if the AV people could confirm for me that it is in fact working that would be awesome. <laughs> <laughs> um, 
It's working. Okay. Just no questions. Uh, okay. I'll, I've got two more of my own, and then I'll, I'll come back. So, um, so uh, Randy, this has come up a lot. Uh, I'm beginning to, to sense uh, how you're going to answer this one. <laughs> Uh, so, what, if any, are the benefits of a CBDC, this is a question that I, I, I ask myself a lot, compared to uh, RTP and FedNow and operating in FedWire, you know, 24-7, 365? I, I feel really, I, you know, I, I, I think it would be sort of better for my image if I maintained a little mystery, but, uh, <laughs> uh, but apparently I am a completely open book. Um, I don't, I don't think there's any benefit. No, that, that's not true. So that, that's you know, clearly uh, a CBDC, a retail CBDC, its principal benefit, as has been mentioned is, right now, is for cross-border payments. Um, and that's something that, you know, you can, that a digital currency doesn't have to be a CBDC, but if there were a CBDC, you can make that virtually costless and immediate and get rid of all the kludgy, expensive infrastructure that we currently have. That would be a fine thing to do. Um, but mentioning a CBDC in juxtaposition to uh, those other systems underscores, again, one of the problems with using a CBDC to achieve that as opposed to a private sector option because if folks who have followed FedNow might remember that I dissented from the FedNow position, one of the principal reasons being that we would discover before we implemented FedNow that there was some better te technology was moving so quickly that we would spend all this money and invest in this white elephant that would possibly anchor us into a system that needed to be immediately replaced before it was even effective. You know, and, and that seems to be happening. Um, and so we will invest all of this money in the current CBDC technology and, and digital uh, asset technology will advance while the Fed is making those investments. Uh, and we will anchor ourselves in uh, something that is, uh, again, outmoded before it's even implemented. That is almost the inevitable consequence of uh, government participation and innovation. And if we had no options, if we were the finance minister of France and we didn't have a technology industry in our country, that maybe should be what we, what we ought to do. But that's not the United States. And so, it, it really doesn't make any sense for us now having, I mean, the whole thing with FedNow, the other reason that I dissented, of course, was that we had basically promised the private sector that we wouldn't compete with them, so they then made investments in creating a system on the basis of a market that we immediately cut in half uh, by changing, you know, by, by changing our minds after they'd made the investment. Now, you know, in, 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 the, in a commercial context, if you deal with a counterparty that makes promises and then repeatedly breaks them at the last minute and costs you money, you don't do business with them anymore, and then apparently you elect them president of the United States. But <laughs> the, the central bank should not do that. So, uh, but we're in the same position with respect to, to CBDCs. We will be competing against the private sector. We will be anchoring our own infrastructure and outmoded technology, and none of it is necessary. Any is my moderate view. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> I, I do want to point out at this point that the second definition of sinecure is something like, you know, a, a place you can go for advice or whatever. <laughs> so, uh, I think that's maybe more what you were shooting at. So uh, that also seems true. Does anyone else want to uh, offer a view on that one? Okay. So uh, Jordan, you have the last uh, structured question. Um, so you know, would CBDC drive out stable coins? Um, yes, a, a few thoughts on this one. Um, the, the first is that the Treasury's goal is not necessarily to drive out stable coins so much as it is to ensure that stable coins are appropriately regulated. So that's, that's the point. Um, just analytically, uh, as to the what what impact would a CBDC have on stable coin demand? Uh, I, I think there are a few points worth making. Um, the first is is something that Daryl alluded to, which is that public money doesn't automatically drive out private money. So in the case of the ECNY. Uh, which was introduced to substitute for Alipay and WeChat. There's something like four and a half million ECNY wallets it plays a fairly limited role in China's payment system. Um, and again, that, that was uh, a CBDC designed to substitute for, for a private alternative. Um, the second point is that um, in the case of the US CBDC and stable coins, I mean, a lot would rest on the design choices that 
context. So retail versus wholesale, uh, holding limits versus no holding limits, interest bearing or not, um, uh, use cases that it supports, whether it can be held abroad, if it can't be held, if the US CBDC can't be held abroad, then maybe CBDC circulates within the United States, but USD stable coins circulate abroad. So the impact of the US CBDC on stable coins would depend on the, on the design choices. Um, and then the final point is just that there, there's a timing issue, um, which is that we see stable coins as kind of a rapidly emerging financial stability risk that need to be addressed Ideally, through legislation today, as soon as possible, uh, CBDC is, is multiple <laughs> years away. Right. Um, and so it doesn't make sense to wait for that to address uh, stable, stable concerns. Thank you. Uh, so uh, we have 45 seconds left. So <laughs> <laughs> Does everyone hear that question? Yeah. Uh, would anyone like to answer that question? Yeah. Daryl? If you, it's positive interest and you look tomorrow, your wallet will have increased a little bit automatically. The interest will have been put back into your CBDC wallet. And if it's negative, it'll be the same. You started today with $100, you wake up in the morning and you look at it, it's only $99.50. Uh, so it's just automatically debited and credited to your account. Not likely in the United States. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. All right, uh, please join me in a round of applause for our <laughs>